Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our fall uh, lecture series here for the Weitzman School of Design Department of Architecture. Tonight, we have a special book launch uh, for Richard Garber's uh, new book that was just recently published called Building Futures, Technology, Ecology, and Architectural Practice. Um, one thing, just as a reminder, um, all of these lectures are good for continuing education credits for the AA. So if any of you um, need those, please see the uh, security guard at the entrance. There's a sign-up sheet that you can put your license number on, and we'll record that and submit those to the AA. And also, I should probably also welcome a few people before I talk about the Richard and the panel. Um, Todd Green is here from Wiley Publishing, uh, made the trip and has a number of the books in his bag. Are they, are they up? They're here. Okay. If you want to check out the printed version, thanks for uh, coming and thanks for your support. I know that there's been many faculty that have made appointments to uh, meet with you uh, today and tomorrow. So really appreciate your uh, generosity of coming. Okay, great. Um, tonight we'll have a round table discussion to celebrate the new book. Uh, the book explores how architects, the buildings, and the environments they create can engage future realities both abstract and readily understood. It addresses the myriad of complexities faced by architects as they practice and seek to engage the 21st century issues of climate change, diversity and social equity, urban development, all medi mediated through the lens of technologies that are rapidly maturing and allowing architects to adopt new design strategies and workflows. A little bit about Richard Garber. Richard Garber is a founding partner at Grow Architects. Uh, Grow received the 2022 Honor Award Residential Category in the annual AIA New Jersey Design Award Competition for Nest, a 122-unit micro-housing project in Jersey City. Richard has written numerous books and essays in which he advocates for technology as it relates to formal speculation, simulation, assembly, and construction solutions. His previous books include Workflows, Expanding Architecture's Territory in the Design and Delivery of Buildings and BIM Design. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, and the other book is BIM Design, Realizing the Creative Potential of Building Information Modeling. The December 2010 issue of Dwell Magazine named him as one of 32 new faces of design and showcase grows precast concrete housing prototype pretty fab. Now a bit about the panel that we'll be discussing uh, Richard's book tonight. It includes uh, two of our own and uh, two guests. So I'm going to be a little bit short on our own bios just to get started. Um, so first of Robert Stewart Smith, who wrote the books forward. He's an assistant professor and the director of our MSD in Robotics and Autonomous Systems program here at Weizmann. Also is Winka Dubeldam, professor and former chair of the Department of Architecture and founder and principal of Architectonics. And then as guest, we have Carenza Harris. Welcome, Carenza. She's an associate principal at Morphosis and is director of the Advanced Technology. She oversees advanced computational design and simulation for all projects at Morphosis. Her team focuses on the research, development, documentation, and integration of advanced technologies from early design phases through the construction process. She also guides the firm's use of XR technology to create immersive environments that aid in testing and communicating concepts through all phases. Carenza is also a faculty at the uh, Southern California Institute of Architecture, aka SciArc, uh, where her teaching focuses on digital design tools and construction. Welcome, Carenza. Also, we have another guest, uh, uh, Sajay uh, Bushan. He's an associate director at Zaha Hadid Architects, where he co-founded and heads the computation and design research group, which is uh, called Zaha Code. He's an alumnus and studio master at the postgraduate 
course of Design Research Laboratory at the Architecture Association, which is also known as AADRL. There he explores the intersection of computer graphics, video games, and metaverse technology, urban development, and modern methods of construction. Uh, Sajay pursues his scientific interest in digital design and robotic fabrication during his doctoral studies at the Block Research Group, a BRG in the, at the ETA in Zurich, and previously as a M uh, in philosophy graduate from the University of Bath in 2016. Welcome, thank you. With that, I'm gonna hand this over to Richard to begin tonight's discussion. Thanks. Thank Uh, thank you, Andrew, and, and thank you, everyone, for, for coming. It's, it's actually really uh, quite meaningful to me to uh, have this launch uh, on home turf, so to speak, and uh, want to thank uh, the Weitzman community uh, for your support over the years, particularly Winka, who is always good to see, and thank you for uh, participating on the panel as well. Um, I'm going to start with a provocation. I'm sort of a broker between our time and the future. He can communicate with the future. We all do, don't they? Emails, credit cards, texts, anything that goes into the record speaks directly to the future. The question is, can the future speak back? So the question is, can the future speak back? Um, I hope everyone has enjoyed the film Tenant. It's actually, uh, anyone has seen it? Um, hopefully, good, good, good. I know Rob has. Um, so um, Tenant posits a provocation, can the future speak back? And um, it's very important for us to position ourselves as architects in a kind of projective place, right? We are optimistic, we are always projecting some kind of potential future, the uh, very essence of what we do. And so um, I'm not gonna read these, but these are um, a series of provocations that occur in the book and also find sympathies, uh, I think, with the panel project uh, that has assembled here. We're gonna come back to these, but I leave these up for you to make mental notes of. Um, related to these points is the global visual scale of the, of the Anthropocene, uh, something that uh, we discuss uh, in each of the sections in the book on technology, ecology, construction, and practice, and something that I think will continuously come up today. Now, Building futures uh, really supports um, uh, a broad uh, group of thinkers uh, and interests, but I think at the core is uh, a kind of support of a generation of architects that are really invested in new ways of making. And um, that's been um, important to me, and I know uh, my colleagues that are participating on, uh, on the panel have, have had a lot of discussions with me about this as well. Um, building today comes in many forms, and while conventional forms of construction still very much exist, we still deal with them every day, um, there are now sequences and operations that break from these norms. Uh, this might mean material operations through advanced automation, um, we see the robots downstairs uh, operating now, right? Uh, or modular schemas, we're gonna talk a bit about modular construction today, um, that increasingly push fabrication and assembly off-site, as well as new and virtual ways of working by remote control, uh, working away from job sites, right? Including the design of material and immaterial workflows, which we will see today, in um, some of the work. Um, what you see up here are slides that are representative of each of the participants that will be speaking today. And as Andrew said, we have um, in the order, Rob will speak next. We will then have Carenza from Morphosis, Shajay, and then we'll conclude, of course, uh, with Winka. Um, all talking about projects that they've, they've executed within this kind of um, scope of um, challenging conventional norms, right? Now, um, Andrew mentioned um, previous, uh, previous publications that I've uh, been involved in. These are all Wiley publications, and uh, again, I'd like to welcome Todd Green. Uh, thank you, and everyone, uh, faculty here I know have been meeting with him. Um, 
Building futures in some ways um, emerges from what has been a 25 year interest for me in design computation and its soft and hardware outcomes, um, including building information modeling and construction assist um, or design assist, depending on which side of building uh, you come from. Um, the goal uh, here in these, these writings has been to utilize technically enhanced design operations to close the gap, that was the title of the first one, between design and building. Um, and while parts of building futures are very much a continuation of the ideas set forth in these publications, uh, building futures also marks a departure in terms of uh, an articulation of object-oriented computing operations, which we'll talk about a little bit, and their relationship through simulation to various ideas about ecology. And ecology um, has, is really one of the most pressing, um, or our response to it is one of the most pressing um, um, objectives I think we as architects have in the 21st century. Now, um, this is one of the graphics from the book. This is a selective history that we put together to, to really kind of track some of the, um, the interests that have gone into building futures. And you'll notice that all of these um, pressures, let's say, um, are external to architecture, right? They challenge our agency and um, force us to adapt, force us to change um, in the way that we practice, the way we um, represent ourselves in the profession, and ultimately the way that we engage the world. Um, the Anthropocene has uh, conventionally been dated to uh, Watt and New, uh, Newcomen's um, steam engines, right? Newcomen was first in 1712, Watt in 1765. The steam engine to um, basically pump water out of coal mines, right? That was the, 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 the sort of uh, thing about it. Um, uh, however, I actually think that the Anthropocene probably dates in some ways back to the 1440s with the emergence of the printing press. Right? And this kind of dissemination of information that allowed for the kind of um, demand and ultimately the supply that fed it, um, that if you track through time, led to in the 20th century a fantastical increase in productivity and also um, very specifically a rise in, um, in CO2 emissions. Right. Um, to quote from uh, Elizabeth Colbert, who has written extensively on this and one of the people that I, I refer to quite a lot, um, uh, the effects of uh, productivity coincided with both short and long-term human imprints on the earth, including a rise in CO2, in CO2 emissions and environmental resource de uh, depletion and degradation. It should be noted that in the 1780s, so about the time of the steam engine, and that's why the Anthropocene is traditionally dated there, right? Ice core records show carbon dioxide levels at about 280 parts per million. This was approximately the same level that they had been at 2,000 years earlier in the era of Julius Caesar, 2,000 years before that at the time of Stonehenge, and 2,000 years before that at the founding of the first cities, right? And um, it's important to note, and everyone knows, how uh, those levels initially rose gradually and then really kind of took off um, in the later part of the 20th century. Uh, and there are, um, you know, uh, uh, endeavors now uh, trying, to, trying to deal with that. Now, in 2018, I was asked to write a, um, uh, an essay for a publication, Arc Plus, the German architecture magazine, um, that um, is called, um, uh, that really, really started thinking about object orientation, right? Um, and this follows uh, an increasing interest of mine in how ecology are made manifest in our work uh, in a more expansive idea of part-to-whole relationships, right? Uh, the, the essay was titled um, Precision Object Orientation Simulation New Standards in Information Modeling. And um, I think what's important about this is that virtual modeling, we all are engaged in this, right, um, has now eradicated many of the intrinsic limits of a non-computational workflow. Um, one uh, for thinkers like Manuel Delanda, sometime uh, teacher here, 
um, uh, who has advocated that virtual models are already real. Uh, with material properties intact, they simply need to undergo some sort of actualization process to become physical. And that might literally be 3D printing or some kind of additive or subtractive manufacturing that we'll hear about today, right? Um, now, what's interesting about the kind of object orientation take on computing is that definitions are more robust and have a very different connotation in part to whole relationships. And this is something that I think we advocate for in a lot of the work that you'll see to, uh, today, which is a kind of expansive idea about these. And so, for example, um, my room example, um, a room can be made up of parts, floors, walls, doors, windows, etc. But a room could also be classified through a different aggregation of um, data. Who owns that room, the size of that room, the location of that room, right? So there are um, ideas uh, in a very specific kind of computation that led to procedural modeling that really give a fair amount of metadata in how we think about things going together to make buildings, but also how that metadata is ultimately used in particularly in advanced simulation schemes, right? Simulation um, very much is at the heart of, of a lot of the things in the book that, um, that are advocated for. Now, interestingly enough, um, when you look back at simulation far enough, you find that simulation actually happened before computers, right? Um, you don't need a computer to necessarily simulate anything. And um, as I was doing this research, I should say that there, there emerged a kind of um, series of heroes, as I like to call them, um, in the book. Uh, NASA being one of them and, and some of the astronauts I'm about to talk about. But this is mission control in the late 60s in Houston. Um, as, as NASA was getting ready to send uh, Apollo 8 up to the moon. And you can see that there are a series of, um, of uh, different kinds of machines and spacecraft that the, that the astronauts actually uh, trained on, right? And um, this led to, and NASA was the first to, to, to coin the term digital twin. These are very, very initial kinds of digital twins that led to this sort of thing. And uh, this might look like the real thing, right? But this is actually a simulation. Uh, these are our two astronauts actually training. One of them, and I think it's the one on the left, is, um, is an astronaut named Ken Mattingly, who interestingly was bumped from Apollo 8 because he contracted, excuse me, Apollo 13, because he contracted measles um, a few days before uh, the mission. Um, Apollo 13 famously got into a little bit of trouble getting back to Earth, um, navigating through the atmosphere. And it was Mattingly who actually went to mission control and operated on simulators, communicating in real time, again in 1970, uh, 1970, yeah, to, to these astronauts to actually get them, get them back, right? So this idea of simulation and this idea of training um, is quite amazing uh, and, and quite meaningful to us, right? Now, I should also note that um, this image came about from one of those Apollo missions, and we all know what this is, Earthrise, that's been, that was photographed by uh, William Anders. Um, at the time, this was the first image taken by a human of the Earth as an object, the Earth outside of the subjective way we understand it and operate within it, right? Um, I should say that there was one satellite photo of the Earth that existed about two years before that, a satellite called ATS-1, also set up, sent up by NASA. But um, there's something extremely human about this in some ways that I think is, um, is, is uh, really important. Um, this um, photo uh, followed the publication uh, uh, a few years earlier of a series of essays by Heidegger. Um, and again, I'm, I'm really trying to touch on points in the book uh, and, and set this up for, for, um, for the panel here. Heidegger actually wrote a series of essays um, in the 1930s between the world wars that would be published in the 50s of, and 60s, including one called The Age of the World Picture. Dates back to 1938 ultimately published right before Bill Anders took this photo, um, in which Heidegger uh, anticipated the eventuality that we would someday soon 
being standing out in front of this instead of being within it, right? And it ushered in, um, I think, a, um, uh, a very different kind of thinking that is very important in the work that we're doing today and ties back into some of that object-oriented computing that I was talking about, right? Now, from the Earth, we jump to another hero, which is a volcano in Iceland. Why Iceland, you say? Um, it turns out that um, this volcano and some specific writing about it by a late uh, philosopher named Paul Scullison um, uh, is important in terms of setting up part-to-whole relationships. Um, Scullison linked aspects of wholeness or holism to health, um, noting that the words whole and health both originated from the same root, which I believe was Greek, um, as in to be healthy is to be whole. Uh, Scullison used the term numinous, which traditionally has had spiritual con connotations, uh, to make clear that the experience of nature, the numinous, does not happen discreetly either in our minds or in nature, but is brought into reality by our encounter with one another under special circumstances. To him, numinous qualities expose the superficiality of any system of ideas, and he concluded that this discovery of nature is an objective exteriority of our subjective selves. Right? So this, I think, ties into uh, some of that work of NASA and certainly Anders photo of Earthrise. And as I dug a little bit deeper into this, what I found was there was this, uh, this um, really interesting uh, overlap between the work Scullison was doing and those same NASA astronauts. This is actually a photo of those same Apollo astronauts in the 19, late 1960s training, right? We talk about simulation, we talk about uh, simulacra training uh, for geological explorations uh, on, the, on the moon, geological experiments, excuse me, on the moon. It turns out that that same area that was so important to Scullison in, in discovering nature was found by NASA as one of the only places left on Earth that hadn't been touched by humans, by us, right? And therefore, it was the perfect place to send the same astronauts that you saw doing those Apollo simulators um, to do geologic studies. Uh, this photo is from 1967, and I will say that we um, had a really wonderful time um, communicating with um, a museum outside of Reykjavik uh, that had all these great photos uh, of Iceland, right? With people maybe connecting from nature. Now, to talk a little bit more about current technology, this is a Gartner hype cycle for emerging technologies. And you can see that um, as time goes and expectations go, um, some of the things that were initially quite important to me, building information modeling, digitally design and construction, are at or past at this point their plateau of productivity. Right? This is a graphic from 2017, and you can see the innovation triggers, digital twins, the Internet of Things, robotics, machine learning, um, human-computer um, interaction or interfaces um, are really um, very topical and um, some really good research that are actually being done by, by some of you in, in this room um, today. Andrew, I didn't flip it, actually, by the way. Um, but. Uh, so this, this um, I think, was a very useful um, uh, chart to, to begin thinking about how technology is understood in the world and how we specifically as architects adopt it. And so this is another graphic from the book um, uh, that we call um, New Ways of Seeing. And you see that in a conventional BIM um, schema, which is the purple thing up top, um, it's all about efficiency. So simulations exist as part of this, but it's really to solve solely efficiency. And I think that um, new ways of seeing allows us as architects in this kind of expanded environment to use simulation to kind of redefine what efficiency is. I was just talking to my students today about redefining efficiencies, right? Um, so you see a kind, of, uh, a kind of graphic that begins privileging a kind of higher level of, of part assembly relationships in the service of uh, simulation and operation. 
Um, moving along, one of the other heroes for sure, and, and his work will come out in the ecology sections, uh, is the late Bruno Latour. Um, he talks about a kind of quasi-object uh, being um, merged somewhere between nature and society. Um, he refers to this graphic as the locus of the quasi-object, where he draws a distinction between the hardness of society and the softness of nature, allows that the work um, arrived at through a hybridized network, hybrids will be important uh, shortly, um, uh, between the two extremes of nature and society. And he writes, if we have never been modern, it's his famous book from 1993, the torturous relations that we have maintained with uh, other nature cultures would also be transformed. Um, two more heroes, and then we're gonna turn it over to Rob. Uh, this is a very interesting diagram uh, that stems from a body of work by an economist named Herman Daly that um, I've, I've actually known about since the early 90s. Um, but he's, a, um, he's someone, uh, one of the first economists in the United States, and there was some work be happening actually in Europe and in France in particular as well, to put a value on the environment and resource depletion as part of a kind of economic model. And uh, thinking about how that economic model um, that, that deals with uh, depletion of natural resources might revalue or reassess um, the cost schemas that we are responsible for meeting as architects, uh, I think is, is, uh, is really important. Um, the graphic here is from uh, Daly's 1992 book called Steady State Economics. Uh, he describes an optimal sustainable state of the human economy as, and I'm quoting, an economy with constant stocks of people and artifacts maintained at some desired sufficient levels by low rates of maintenance, throughput, uh, that's throughput there, uh, that is uh, by the lowest feasible flows of matter and energy uh, from the first stage of production, which is depletion of low entropy materials from the environment to the last stage of consumption, which is pollution of the environment with high entropy wastes and exotic materials. So you get a sense of what, uh, I tried to do a kind of quick 10 minute overview here before we open the panel. I'm gonna very quickly end by talking about the last um, hero. This is a um, devil's hole pupfish. Has anyone heard of these things? Okay, so the devil's hole pupfish end up being um, really amazing. Uh, their population has dwindled down to, um, they've been as low as 30, 30 left in the world, right? Uh, they spend their entire life and the entire species exists in that thing on the right, which is about an eight foot by 60 foot crevasse in a place called Devil's Hole in the Nevada desert, right? And you can see there's algae, there's some shade, there's some shelves and, uh, the population of fish have really learned how to use this space, eight feet by 60, that's it, to spawn and thrive. Um, this is being um, challenged by, um, by obviously climate change, by global warming, um, because what's happened is this water that has maintained a temperature, a constant temperature because of shading of about 92.3 degrees over hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years. It's thought that they're there, they were, they've been there for between 10,000 and 20,000 years, uh, that their population is dwindling. And there have been various um, attempts to take them and transport them to other places. It didn't work. Lo and behold, a $13 million grant from the Forestry Service, and they now all live in a simulacra in a closed space, also in the Nevada desert, about 10 minutes away from their original habitat. And what strikes me about this is building futures, future buildings um, are not only for humans, right? And um, this completely meets the definition of architecture, right? It's climate, leak, climate, climate controlled, excuse me. Um, it's heavily censored, it has a foundation, it's wet and dry and does everything the fish need to do to survive. However, it's completely synthetic, right? Human made, and um, believe it or not, the fish are thriving there more so than they are in Devil's Hole. Now, so with that, um, uh, very quickly, this is uh, the book in, in parts. Uh, there are copies of the book here that we can pass around if people wanna take a look at them. 
Um, please don't run off with them if possible. There's just not that many in the world right now. Um, but um, there are sections on technology, ecology, construction, and conclude with practice. But you'll see that there are um, in here some very, very notable projects that have been uh, created, that have been, that have been, excuse me, curated to, to speak to these, these various um, uh, these various chapters and points that are made. Um, so with that, what I'd like to do is call Rob Stewart Smith up. And Rob, I'm just going to advance to your slides here um, to talk a little bit about his work in robotics and uh, a little bit about writing the foreword of the book. So thank you, Rob, please. Thank you, Richard. Uh, it's been a pleasure to read your thoughtful and provocative book um, and to write the introduction of it. Um, I'll save more of my kind of personal comments about that for the, for the discussion, um, but it's a fantastic book. Um, so at, at one of the things I mentioned in the introduction is that at some level, architecture is a material response to a diverse array of social, economic, environmental, geopolitical, and discursive conditions. Um, and its means uh, is inherently tied to technological progress arriving, arising from both within and outside of the profession, mostly outside. Um, and that the profession is a highly co collaborative one, um, where most of the activities are now mediated by software um, that is involved in the conception, communication, and delivery of projects. Um, and yet, when it comes to um, digital design, um, there, since there was a lot of movement in the 90s and then a, since then a lot of adoption of BIM, for perhaps two decades there's been very little discussion uh, about what software does um, within practice and academia. It's almost taken for a given. Um, and when you think of what a building information model is, we associate it mainly with automating uh, construction documentation. Um, but if you think about um, some drastic changes that are happening in the world today, um, both technologically and in all the other factors I mentioned before, um, then there's a lot more at stake than thinking about designing through automating construction documentation. And as you can see in this slide, that there's three key areas that um, we're seeing more and more moving into building information modeling as we start to see it more as a digital twin rather than a building information model, more like the NASA uh, simulacrum that uh, Richard mentioned earlier. Um, so the timeliness of this book couldn't be more impactful, um, not only because of the transition in technology, but because of the need um, that the architecture profession is facing. Um, firstly, there's the environmental and socioeconomic urgency. Um, buildings, as you know, have a substantial environmental impact. Uh, the lion's share of energy consumption, material waste, carbon emissions, and so forth. But also, um, we, need, we aren't keeping up with present needs for, for things like housing and, and building development whatsoever. And we have an estimated 2.5 billion additional people moving to cities um, before 2050. And so we're in a situation where um, this, apply, this kind of need for building cuts across different uh, sizes of economy, different cultures, um, economic conditions. Um, but I have put some things on the slide that relate to the US and the UK. Um, believe it or not, the U UK is the sixth largest growing construction market right now because it has uh, a need for 4.75 million houses. It's undersupplied. Um, but in the US and the UK, we have a serious unaffordable um, building construction industry uh, where buildings are very expensive to build. Um, and we have an extremely low supply. Productivity, um, Richard mentioned productivity in the scope of centuries, but when we look since the 1950s in the US, agriculture and manufacturing has increased by 10 to 15 times productivity. Construction is negative at the moment, negative 1% per year. So construction has remained flat. It's highly unproductive. It's incredibly wasteful. It's also the most fatal uh, uh, manufacturing sector there is globally. 
Um, in the, it's three times any other sector in the UK and the US and five to six times in the world. So we have, and we have a declining skilled labor workforce. So basically there's an, a real need for change. And uh, if we look into how we manage, you know, leverage technology, technology in this, we can find ways to reduce material, reduce time, reduce cost, improve environmental conditions, improve the quality of the built environment, and make buildings more affordable for people. And we can do that while being more creative at the same time. We're at the beginnings of the fourth industrial revolution, which is ushering in autonomous forms of manufacturing. That's one of the key technologies of the fourth industrial revolution. And with that, we can increase productivity, decrease cost and waste, and I'm sure bring on a whole lot of other problems like increasing consumption and so forth. It's not a clear-cut positive thing, but if we're critical and creative, there's a lot we can do with it. Um, and if you think about what it means in terms of architectural design and production, we went from, Richard showed the death of uh, the artisan, uh, you know, and, and um, moving into mass production. Well, even though we've gone through three industrial revolutions before now, um, including mass customization, or so uh, in the third one, most buildings are built with mass production. That's where the economics of construction still lies is with standardization. And standardization is another way of talking about generalization. So buildings are generalized to suit industrial standards to make them economical, but we can't produce enough of them. But also, every building is, has unique needs. Every uh, occupant of a building has unique needs. There's microclimates and so forth, and so, with the fourth industrial revolution, we have the ability to treat each project as a one-off. And um, that's uh, because of the technologies associated with it. So on the left, you see on the top 3D printing on site. On the bottom left, uh, robot bricklaying. Both of these technologies, um, this is commercially in use right now. There's nothing necessarily architectural about the work you see on the screen, but any design that uses the same material quantity and the same manufacturing time costs the same. So suddenly you're in the position where every project can be considered, can be thoughtful, can be site specific. On the top right, you have a robotic prefabrication of volumetric modules. And on the bottom uh, right, you have a factory that's actually on a construction site moving up like jump form concrete. And then we have a whole lot of more cute and interesting on-site robots that are doing individual tasks. Um, but more and more, we're seeing a lot of uh, construction moving into factories where there's an even more controlled environment. Um, beyond that, we're also seeing robot systems becoming the primary occupants of some buildings. Um, so what you see here is a Nakado uh, grocery fulfillment warehouse. Um, where the primary occupant is these little robots. There's thousands of them. Um, and so we need to start thinking uh, both in terms of ecology, as uh, Richard was saying, but also about uh, the fact that we're living in a much more connected world where um, we see the emergence of urban operating systems that enable us to manage and track in real time urban assets as a network of cyber physical systems. It's in this context that my research lab, the Autonomous Manufacturing a lab um, works across generative architectural design and computation, behavior-based robotic fabrication and multi-agent construction. It's a multidisciplinary lab that operates at Penn in architecture and UCL in computer science. We work on design and production of robotically fabricated architectures, such as this sightless house that's been designed for disassembly and relocatable, um, relocation and reuse. This is done together with Masud Akbazadeh and other Penn faculty and CEMEX Global Research and, um, Research and Development Headquarters. So we're developing a super thin precast concrete uh, that reduces material volume, and we'll build this um, small house on campus sometime very soon. The lab also develops computational approaches to design of additive manufactured architecture that is anisotropic and increases topological complexity to enhance structural and material efficiencies. You can see some fabricated parts here next to a high resolution structural analysis and some performance criteria designs are evolved towards. We also look at robot and material behavior as something that can be programmed to provide material expression. 
such as in these concrete 3D printed panels um, that are developed through scanning in the loop on some uh, false formwork. We also leverage semi-autonomous programming to enable robots to perceive material and improvise the actions in subtractive methods. In this case, adapting to a clay body, um, producing two different outcomes when trying to sculpt the same geometry, but responding to the shape of the clay body that it's working with. So basically creating through the act of making. Autonomous programming also extends into our support for mobile robots to navigate 3D scan and take 360-degree image capture on construction sites. This type of thing is typically done by a human that visits the site periodically through a week, and we're doing this uh, so that there can be high-frequency data collection um, that can uh, save a lot of uh, mistakes and, and rework on site. We're also building capabilities to adaptively build from a digital twin, BIM model. This involves um, the development of a high-precision metrology system for super accurate manufacturing and robots um, calculating where they're going to move in real time, avoiding collisions with what they've already built and with each other. So what you're seeing is path planning by the robot um, and it actually deciding what it's going to build next. Um, We've developed hardware and software for several custom mobile robot platforms and how they can coordinate to that task together collectively, um, particularly for additive manufacturing. And um, this type of collaboration extends into areas where robots must build with unpredictable materials. So this is an expanding foam that's very volatile. It can't create a stable shape. And this has been constructed by robots that are flying. One of them is scanning and the other is adjusting its trajectory in um, response to what was scanned by the previous robot. And so you get this very straight cylinder, even though it's a very unpredictable material and each layer is a variable condition. Um, so that was part of a project that was published in Nature last year called Aerial AM, or Aerial Additive Manufacturing. It was the world's first 3D printing demonstration in flight. Uh, in this case, we're extruding a custom cementitious material from a custom quadcopter, custom extrusion hardware and, and delta arm manipulator, and which, which is doing error correction. It's a collaboration with about five universities uh, involving material scientists, aero roboticists. Um, and um, my lab worked on a lot of aspects of the project, but particularly on multi-robot coordination. So we developed a software framework that enables several drones to actually undertake the 3D printing tasks adaptively from bottom-up rule sets. So there is nothing prescribed. It's completely design agnostic. Um, and you can throw a different geometry into the software platform and have aerial robots um, distribute that and build collectively. So that same, it's the same software that controls the real robots and the simulation of robots building. And it's that same software that we also develop designs that operate through con construction activities. So where some creativity arises through spontaneity in the construction process. What you see here is a shell structure, but one that is designed to not need scaffolding while it's been constructed. So it's incrementally building with uh, structural analysis in the loop and providing additional supports that might be redundant for a shell that's built with scaffolding, but are necessary if you want to build without scaffolding. Several other projects that I don't have time to present today, but this is a two kilometer high tower developed in collaboration with structural engineers. The exoskeleton is designed through the interactions of the robots as they build, modeled on that um, two robot collaboration you saw before where one robot is scanning while the other robot's printing. Um, and very briefly, uh, at Penn, we also have, it's now in its fourth year, a Master's of Science in Design in Robotics and Autonomous Systems that's really looking for integrated approaches to robotic fabrication and architectural design. Uh, students in the program develop custom manufacturing approaches with robots um, that are often critically looking at uh, industry manufacturing approaches and seeing how we can um, reduced waste and increased variability in design, um, but do things rapidly. So this is a die-cast extrusion process that's in incredibly cheap and economical and rapid to do on a robot to create kind of bundled facades. Um, part of that creativity extends to the design of robot tooling and simulation modeling 
uh, in this case is tied very much to material behavior and tool behavior or robot behavior. Um, and in this case, that simulation modeling was critical in enabling um, six, 12 unique parts to be made from four molds. So there's this idea here of producing a lot of variation through um, the production of, of new ways of working that try to integrate across you know, hardware, software, and manufacturing processes. And the last project I'm going to leave you with from that master's program is one that also extended questions of facade screens to be that of thinking about a multi-species facade, um, looking at bird strikes and thinking about spaces for birds to rest uh, as they migrate. And that, you know, uh, it already starts to change the way in which one starts to think about the design criteria. And of course, this is a very short research project into, that's mainly focused on a manufacturing method. So it's not like any birds were interviewed during the process, right? Um, but essentially there is there's a, uh, a manufacturing method for kind of multi-axis 3D printing and for manipulating the 3D print, print post-production. It's providing a kind of nesting spaces or resting spaces, sorry, and also a, a kind of texture um, that starts to speak of a material and manufacturing process um, and one that's considering more than just an anthropocentric view. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, beautiful, quite interesting stuff. Um, I, I thought today uh, I would focus the conversation a little bit on, well, the presentation on the conversation that we had with uh, Richard, um, and it was kind of an intimate conversation between Tom Main, uh, Atsushi Sugiuchi, who works with me, and myself. Um, and a lot of the stuff that I'm going to show you today is really just background to what you find um, we found in the book, and also just kind of caveat that all the the kind of development and technological development that we do in the office is very much. Uh, kind of applied in projects. We don't really have like a separate research group that um, kind of functions uh, independently. So um, the first thing that we kind of looked at, try to see if I can remove the, sorry, I'm trying to start it. Uh, it's not, it's not starting, so maybe. Okay, that, I got it, I got it. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, so one of the things that we looked at is uh, the work that we've done in the last five years or so, which kind of uh, um, demonstrates like a really large shift in the kind of project that we're looking at, but also kind of a wider range of projects that we're undertaking. Part of that widening, obviously, uh, beyond the fact that we do a lot of international work, uh, is the scale of projects. We go from regional design all the way down to hotel room design, right? So it requires quite a uh, kind of a flexibility there. We're also uh, kind of looking at a, a building types and building typologies that we had not necessarily done before. And so we have to develop kind of an expertise on some of uh, those uh, particular uh, aspects of the, the practice. And we're also uh, really kind of doing a, a lot of work on refining our response to kind of envir environmental challenges uh, which kind of are forced that we understand to be global and local to each project and also unique uh, to each project. And so the resultant here is that we're kind of getting quicker and more flexible in our response to kind of changing conditions that may occur in each project, which means that we're also constantly reevaluating our current strategies and the way that we work. The core methodology or the design methodology that we've always kind of followed is centered around uh, the creation of kind of a broad organizational system. And what it does, it uh, kind of identifies the factors that influence, influence a project. It uh, systematizes them and integrates them in an architectural composition. And the approach is scalable. Um, almost infinitely, and it's also flexible enough that we can we can create a singular response to one project while also operating uh, under kind of a broader set of constraint, right? 
And so today, that process has become complex enough, not only because of the current world conditions, but also um, kind of in terms of like the complexity of the buildings that we're making generally. And um, we need to support it with an expansive digital infrastructure, right? Now, the basic of the, the basis kind of like uh, organization of that structure is uh, quite common these today is uh, a 3D digital model that's at the nexus of the networks of things that are happening, right? So we have visualization, simulation, prototyping, robotics, physical modeling, all of those items are kind of looping in and out of the construct. And our, our discussion also addressed form making at the very kind of basic level. And um, in this example, you can see that we use kind of a share common drivers that are represented by uh, lines, points, and play, planes. And um, operations are performed on primitive solids. And the output variations of those primitives are really the result of an evolution process, right? We're not erasing, recreating. We're just like slowly kind of uh, sharing common histories and relationships, and we're coming to a set of solution. Now, this pipeline is a, uh, an ecosystem that is not uh, that is process driven, not software driven. So, in in some ways, we sometimes end up with multiple. Uh, you know, architectural software for delivery, design and delivery of project. And to really maintain that kind of cohesive workflow, the goal is to create uh, connections between the software and focus on kind of an integration of data and geometry. And so we use kind of commercially available tools, uh, you know, to, pro to promote some of that. But then we do a lot of like small intervention. This one kind of uh, uh, is a custom tool that helps us like rationalize and optimize curve right, curves in general. We recreate native geometry in several software back and forth. Um, there's a little bit, little bit of like a parametric data that may be flowing with it as well. And some latency, some stop gaps in between, but in general, we kind of try to minimize the kind of workflow um, disruptions. We also kind of cross pollinate or uh, cross platform some of the analysis tools that we have to kind of provide either uh, real time feedback or, or the appearance of real time, uh, and we do that from one software to the, to the other to kind of find the best combination of input to output um, geometry. And this is the installation that we did for the Milan Design Week in 2019, where we simulated the experience in advance. We uh, choreographed movement, circulation, panel rotation, digital content, sound, lights, and fabrication at some point as well. And the experience narrative is set up a kind of as a highly controlled uh, environment on our side, but for the visitor, it appears or it is experienced as a, almost like an open world where you can make your own decision and kind of choices of uh, decision making, I guess. Uh, this is the Orange County Museum of Art, um, which we just finished. And we use a lot of these types of tools for the kind of highly activated space like the atrium, for example. Uh, we selected terracotta as the facade cladding. We learn everything there, there is to learn about the material, the fabrication process, and all the other kind of properties that we may find. Um, we parameterize the factor and integrate them in the system, and then we apply a set of rules. In the original competition, we had actually designed like a hard horizontal line across all the facades. But then once we started kind of parameterize the, the original kind of like tile, let's just say, uh, it actually showed a kind of a, a behavior that deviated from that original concept. And in this case, the tile caused like an expected, an expected conditions to emerge, which uh, was actually uh, what we wanted to do in uh, kind of the horizontal line disappeared. So, I mean, I think in general, uh, we've learned that geometry has become meaningless if the performative characteristics are not uh, integrated into it. And the digital framework is really kind of essential uh, for us and give us the, the capability not only to embed data in it early, but also to impose uh, like a rules of behavior and um, kind of uh, systematize them and also establish the relationship through kind of operational strategies. 
And in this context, we have an infinite number of, of solutions. Uh, and uh, they're generated through this process. And they all meet the same performance criteria. So in the, in the end, it's really freeing us to make a decision. You can almost say that we're going back in time and now we're selecting the final artifact based on essentially what we like best since they're all performing exactly at the same level. Thank you. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, thank you, Richard, for the opportunity to uh, uh, visit you and then also talk at this event and, and contribute to the book. Um, the context uh, in which the article is situated in the, in the book is, is largely wh what I will talk about and, and a few specifics from the article. Um, so the larger context is relating to creating consensual and sustainable urban futures. Um, so, and, and part of the future um, endeavor or of, of like the work that we do in Zadi, the architects and like the group, uh, my group does, um, is trying to educate and enable future generations to deal with the problems that we have created and also uh, benefit from uh, some of the opportunities. And the larger context in that sense is, as Rob already mentioned, we need cities, uh, mostly because they only occupy 1% of the surface area of the planet and about 70% of the population by 2050 and most of the wealth of nations and, and also most of the pollution. Um, so how are these cities being built in India, in Africa, in, in Southeast Asia and so on? They're following a model that is known to fail uh, already in North America. It is the motor city, it is the sprawl city and, 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 and counterintuitively, the dense, pedestrian-friendly, uh, hum humane cities like Barcelona are being uh, disfavored in a way. And we all know that sprawl costs a whole lot more. Uh, infrastructure costs and also mental health and social um, uh, cohesion costs. And as you can see here, Atlanta and Barcelona are the same number of population uh, and an order of magnitude greater pollutions. So what can we as architects and architectural technologists do and to, to uh, contribute to, to resolving these issues? Um, I'm going to talk about two specific pilot projects that we are uh, trying to pilot in, in, in our company, which also articulate two specific attitudes about sustainable design. Um, and we're broadly categorizing that as engaging and responsible design. So starting with engaging design, what we mean by that is user in the loop design because unloved buildings are not sustainable. Um, as Rob mentioned, the building industry is causing about 40% of all uh, pollution and 40% of that happens when you demolish buildings ahead of their expiration date. And they get demolished ahead of their expiration date because we don't ask people what they want before we build them. So one of the pilot projects that we are trying to do uh, is leverage gaming technologies to, uh, to first create a cohesive community online and subsequently uh, uh, physically host them uh, on, on land. Uh, so this is a pilot project in um, the island of Roatan in Honduras. Um, so what we did was leverage video game technology, particularly Unreal uh, Engine, and we created this kind of game of um, where people can participate and invite their neighbors um, and friends to, to uh, customize their house in 3D, including the site, uh, not just the interiors, and also then walk around um, and get a sense for uh, what they're investing in. As we all know, creating, uh, purchasing houses or owning houses is one of the biggest financial investments any family will make. Um, so in this this online configurator, browser-based configurator, actually entailed giving users a whole lot more choice of not only the location in 3D, but also the interior layout and so on. But it also meant a whole lot more work for architects because for every possible choice that the users may make in the pixel space, uh, we have to compute the corresponding geometry and, and structural implications and so on. 
Um, but this process also means that investors already get assured buyers, which is also one of the biggest waste in, in the construction industry is that people build and then figure out people, uh, you know, developers build things and then they figure out that nobody wants to buy what has been built. <clears throat> so here, yeah, we are able to aggregate like kind of demand and like kind of uh, de-risk at least part parts of that process. And subsequently, builders also kind of get like firm orders and, and they can also clearly uh, program their delivery sequence uh, from raw material all the way to the constructed home. So that's one part of the pilot project that we are trying to um, uh, will into uh, reality. And the second pilot project, like which we have now uh, done twice, uh, is this uh, footbridge uh, prototype, which is um, <clears throat> uh, constructed using masonry techniques or revisiting masonry techniques. This entire footbridge has no steel uh, in any of the blocks and there is no glue between the blocks and most of the 53 blocks are hollow. And how is this possible? Because we are including uh, or inheriting ancient wisdoms of masonry construction, of aligning material, very humble material, low carbon material along specific geometric patterns. Which in, and combining that with uh, modern methods of like 3D concrete printing to remove 40% uh, or 50% of the material. So in a way, we are thinking of concrete as a synthetic stone, and and whatever we can do with stone, we can do it with this uh, 3D concrete printed stone. And we also innovated in creating very lightweight, integrated design to fabrication and assembly software, custom software that you can see is bespoke tailored to the process and it doesn't have all the other things that normally architects don't need. And so this footbridge is also an example of building elements that if we incorporate the same principles into building elements, like we can save up to 70% of concrete and maybe up to 90% of steel. And as we all know, the floor slab is about 40% of most buildings that we see around us. And this is a pioneering project, commercially available product now uh, by the Block Research Group and Holds in Foundation. So the idea is, is to try and replace part by part um, all of these standardized catalog of building parts uh, with these customizable, uh, uh, structurally customizable um, building parts. So with these two projects, like what we want to try and communicate is that like on the one hand, we, we can innovate and get um, users engaged with the process of design, increase civic engagement with our cities, um, and at the same time, once you have that demand, um, also deliver these buildings uh, in, a, in a kind of materially effective and cost effective uh, timely manner, uh, which is partially what we are now trying to do in, since 2017, like these are some of the projects that my team is contributing to. Um, and most of these are uh, computer generated images, except for two at the bottom right, uh, hopefully. The, the remaining project, uh, remaining images also become reality in the next uh, coming five years. So with that, I thank you for your attention. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Richard, for inviting all of us uh, to write in the book. Um, really looking forward to seeing the book. <laughs> it's great that, uh, that this is going out. So, um, ecolo ecology section. As we all know, evolution used to be something that was a gradual change. But currently now in the Anthropocene, there is a sudden... Oh, sorry. Oh, maybe. Okay. There is a sudden uh, human and environmental impact that has caused a huge reset rather than a gradual change. The dichotomy of nature and culture is deeply embedded in Western thought and has formed our conventional understanding of architecture as a timeless, immutable thing resisting the flux of time and matter. But today's absolute impact of human civilization over everyday life form, geology, and environment on Earth and its newfound ability to mani manipulate every building block and of organic life has led to a radical dissolution of boundaries and definitions. What is man-made and natural can no longer be clearly distinguished. 
and with genetically altered organisms, hybrid materials and symbiotic uh, systems now offering the opportunity for highly efficient, intelligent and reactive building materials and phenotypes. But the consequences of pollution and uh, prolonged ignoring of the consequences of climate change are also ex astronomically expensive. Some econo economists and climate scientists have calculated that climate change could, co could cost the US alone the equivalent of nearly 4% of its gross domestic product by 2100, which is likely a conservative estimate as it leaves out consequential damages of drought, floods, and other climate mitigations and migration. The annual US cost of flooding today is over 32 billion nationwide, and flooding has cost the US taxpayer, because of course it comes back to us, an estimated 850 billion since 2000. So not only are all these numbers we saw before of migration and taking cities and pollution, it's also costing us enormous amounts of money. So, what are monsters and mutants? This is, as we all know, the Fukushima nuclear um, disaster that happened. And you might wonder, is this uh, photoshopped? It is actually not photoshopped. These are sunflowers that are uh, placed around the nuclear um, a nu nuclear uh, site, the disaster site, because um, these flowers are hyperaccumulators, which means that they have, through phytoremediation, take up huge amounts of pollution from the soil and um, are able to clean the soil actually in quite rapid um, matter, causing kind of a new normal. But not only do they clean up the soil, they also respond in their organic uh, formation, as you can see here. Uh, this is called cresting or elongating of something that used to be concentric and then becomes something that is no longer concentric but extremely uh, contorted. And um, this cresting actually not only makes that the flowers are able to survive a nuclear disaster, um, but they change their behavior and they change their formation. They cause a complete reset. And this reset is interesting not only because they survive the nuclear disaster, but they're also able to absorb even more uh, nuclear waste. So it is a very strange thing. So the question is, uh, not only do we humans need nature in um, a quite almost like one-to-one -one relationship, uh, this is actually coined into implication by uh, some uh, geologists. Um, there is a book um, by Meeker and Sabar um, called Radical Botany that uh, describes our impl in implied relationship, but also would we not be able to learn way more of plant intelligence and um, hence be able, like the sunflower, to radically change maybe, how architecture or we even uh, can cause this radical reset that might make us more resistant or resilient to change uh, of the environment as we all undergo it. Um, we at some point, 2018, won um, this um, 1.6 uh, kilometer long site for uh, something that is actually also a huge pollutant, the Olympic Games. Uh, they're highly uh, criticized because not only are they causing massive migration of people, they also deplete resources, they uh, cause pollution. Um, there is actually not much positive news about an Olympic uh, game. Um, but um, as we are revisiting everything, also this was revisited. And um, the competition asked for um, a, an, an action that was um, quite an uh, impressive one. It asked for a, a site that was 116 acres, that was 85% park, had 2 million, 2 million square foot of building in there, uh, but also had to be a sponge city, which I will explain in a moment. Sponge cities essentially are really important because we harden the cities. Cities are not capable of absorbing water or stormwater, as we know, hence flooding, pollution, water gets no longer filtered. So this site, as you can see, the underground is actually more occupied than the above ground. 
and uh, several strategies we came up with. I should also actually maybe start with the very first strategy we came up with is the realizing that the question was so difficult that you could never address this as an architecture office alone. So we went into this competition equal partners with structure engineers Tonton Tomasetti or Scott Lomax in this person in the competition and milk landscape architects um, to really go in equal partners and work with three offices at the same time. Um, because 116 acres and seven buildings is not a small feat in, what was it, six weeks, I think, uh, at SD level, which was another um, nice challenge. So you can see the buildings um, are uh, varied. Uh, there's several rethinkings going on. I'll go through it really quickly. One was also a zero earth strategy, means the earth excavated for restored wetlands and uh, the underground shopping um, mall that was rethought as a connective uh, valley through the site uh, where the earth was used to actually then put that on buildings and recreate the park on top of buildings that then also didn't have to be excavated that far. Uh, solar wings were installed, uh, new wetlands were used for cooling for the buildings. And most importantly, what was the park and the buildings going to be for the future of the city and for the neighbors? So we, uh, from the beginning, proposed if, if the client was so interested in a sponge city, could we not think of the buildings as hybrids or uh, what we call synthetic natures and create these buildings for the future of Hangzhou rather than as white elephants after the Asian Games? Um, and we also proposed um, not only to make green areas, but to reintroduce local vegetation in a quite variety of um, schemes, not only blooming through the different periods of the year, but also to recreate the other half of the biome, which is animals and uh, insects, uh, to, to kind of bring everything back to the site. So, uh, Sponge City, to quickly recap, bioswales, wetlands, perforated pavement, all to retain, uh, filter, and uh, ultimately uh, use this water also as grey water and irrigation water and cooling water. The, the project got a um, lead platinum, or what we call in China, label three uh, certificates. And uh, I think the most um, interesting image I received, this was just after construction was done in the middle of COVID, um, there was this moment where um, the 85% park really looked like 85% park. So you have to imagine in here are 2 million square foot of housing and seven buildings. Um, as you can see, a lot of these gravel drains, uh, islands in the river to speed up the water, um, wetland vegetation to filter the water. Uh, but then uh, what was really fun is that you can claim things, but you don't know whether they happen, right? So you can say it's for the people of the city, but is that really going to happen? Then the Asian Games uh, were postponed for a year from 2022 to 2023, and the neighborhood pulled in. So at some point, actually, this photo was picked up by one of the people in my office on social media. I was very insulted because we made this outdoor cinema for people and someone was camping, or actually two families were camping on his stage which was um, not appreciated, but it was really nice to see how people actually then took over. So the idea of the shopping uh, valley was really this. So um, the site was bisected by a road and a river. Um, we made a green valley, again, a hybrid. So the mix of shopping and a green valley to make uh, something that is essentially uh, more integrated in nature and stays kind of much more humble on, uh, let's say, uh, pedestrian level. Um, it was devised, lots of bridges over, escalators back to the road, aqueduct for the river, viaduct for the road, uh, which then looked uh, like this in August when I was there, where the, green, the, the shopping pavilions have green roofs, uh, trees are actually going through the site, and um, it's quite interesting to see how it's kind of in, like the high line where thousands of people not only go over in like the high line, but this is like an underline. Everyone goes over, but we have these long pedestrian bridges also going over everything. And I'll show one example of um, maybe what we thought was the idea of a hybrid. Uh, if you think of synthetic nature and rethinking of monsters and mutants, if we want to call it that, 
we thought that you cannot just say that a building is going to be hybrid or that it's going to be uh, used in different ways, but that you would have to create a typology that would make people want to use it in different ways. So we um, first created kind of the ideal uh, stadium form, then uh, took the inner stadium and the outer ball, intersected them, shifted them, and started to create something which we thought could start to approximate kind of a topology or new taxonomy, which starts to talk more about hybrids. So a lot of intersecting uh, shapes, as you can see here, but also kind of a rethinking of the structure by creating a suspend dome or a super dome, which uh, renders the building column free, which means, you know, adaptable, easy use. Um, but also the, the suspend dome sits on the inner arena cantilevers out to carry the facades, which then allows for the facades uh, to be also column free as a sort of a diagrid. Um, the seating was also rethought really of as a mix between an arena and a theater. Uh, building was devised to be like a human body, so we sweat, we breathe, um, so there's automatically openable windows just under the roof line that allow hot air out. We're only chilling the seats of the viewers rather than the space. Um, this is actually a diagram by Thornton Tomasetti. And um, as you can see here, the space around the arena is kind of a free flow of stairs and ramps and a future lobby for the concert hall that goes out on a VIP balcony. And I think we all talked about it, so your, your um, normal Rhino Maya model goes um, into the production and became a BIM model. Um, actually, I should maybe show you this first. So this is still our Rhino model where we are looking at a column-free facade, a diagrid. Diagrids typically save about 45% of the steel. And how we could use planar glass to um, make a double curved surface, uh, one, to speed up because we had very little time. We have imagined we won in 2018, we had to be done in 2022 with seven buildings. So we thought if we made the glass planar, one, we saved a million and a half dollars, and two, we speeded up the time uh, enormously fast. Um, but you also, I thought it was really important that the, where the brass shingles were having a quite beautiful texture, to also have the glass have that uh, very deep texture. So we designed eyelids um, or triangulated aluminum frames for the glass to, um, to get that effect. And here you can see a little bit of the mutant monster um, aspect, um, sort of really enticing people to think about the building in a different way, like not as a stadium, but as a building with other um, opportunities, what was really lovely, again, like the park. In the year that the uh, games were postponed, we had concerts and things already happening there, so that was quite a, a, a great thing. And then the inside space you can see here, you see the, um, the top ring of windows with small uh, actuators to open the windows uh, automatically when the air gets to a certain temperature there. The inside of the bowl is clad with bamboo. Uh, Hangzhou is one of the biggest uh, forests of bamboo. By the way, bamboo can create in uh, seven years in oxygen and absorbing carbon, but a tree can do in 40 years. So we really should all replace building with wood that, you know, those trees we need to breathe, they create our oxygen, maybe build with bamboo way more. Um, and then the building had an alter ego, which was a fitness center um, that is for the future of the city. Um, again, with um, soil on top and a complete life of its own, uh, completely walkable. Um, but what is quite interesting maybe about this park also is that because it has so many buildings under it that have all natural light and natural ventilation, is that there is, when you're walking through the site, there is really deep uh, gaps sometimes where you get a building does need normal egress. So you get these really intricate, deep, deep um, hallways that are actually below ground, uh, or a skylight sitting in the grass, or all kinds of other artifacts or here an army of um, gardeners that is keeping up the 116 acres of park um, as it moves on. And then um, really nice is, of course, the enormous amount of water on this site uh, gives these kind of moments of reflection 
or um, here you see how watery the site uh, has become. This is actually the river coming by. This is not an artificial line of water. This is the normal river. The wetlands are behind there. And then back you see the other uh, stadium. There's a field hockey stadium that is uh, an, an after the games in outdoor cinema. I think everyone can come up, right? While we're looking at this. Yeah? Yeah, while everyone's um, getting their seats, I'll just say a few words. Um, Richard asked me to uh, moderate the, the discussion tonight. Yeah, so first of all, Richard, thank you again for writing such a compelling book and putting together such an exciting group of people. And thank you all for your ex excellent presentations and phenomenal work. Um, when Richard asked me to write the introduction to the book on BIM, I was curious as to what he would write about, having um, seen as he'd written so much on the topic before. Um, and for all intents and purposes, most offices I wouldn't have thought had done much with it in recent uh, years. Um, but he put together a lot of very interesting and um, thought-provoking and progressive work um, in the practice work, but he also put together a lot of uh, different chapters covering several topics that really provoke us to, to think beyond the status quo and to, and to challenge where we see the profession going and, and how the profession's relationship is to ecology, technology, and, and construction, and software, and so forth. Um, and uh, one, one of the things that uh, I think it really does is question the agency of the architect and also um, how much of that agency is directed towards asking bigger questions um, such as uh, things like the Anthropocene and um, its relationship to Timothy Morton-esque hyper objects such as climate change, things that span a much longer time period than than the time period in which a building tends to exist, let alone be designed or constructed in. Um, Richard and I put together a set of pro uh, propagations in relation to the book um, that let's hopefully this is the right version. Um, uh, and um, basically this will serve the basis for the discussion. Um, and uh, it starts with a statement um, that you can see there, but I'll, I'll read it out to you. Um, the forces that are shaping architecture and its practice in the late 20th and 21st centuries are external to the discipline. These include technological, ecological, economic, and socio-cultural factors. Many of these pressures are challenging our agency and forcing us to adapt in ways that not only allow us to expand our practice, but also to redefine our profession's engagement with the world. So based in that context, um, and you know, feel free to bring in examples from your presentations or, or anything else that comes to mind. Um, but the first question to all of you um, is how can architects turn these challenges into opportunities to rethink the way we design buildings? And if you've forgotten what I'm referring to, it's, it's <laughs> back there. I'll, I'll just rephrase it again. Um, so. The I challenge can, is a technical. Go can for answer. it. I okay. can answer. I heard you the first time. Um, no, I think, honestly, uh, for I think all of us, I mean, everyone who has spoken had, has these amazing um, statistics where we are 40% of the carbon footprint as buildings and households alone, right? So, um, or up to. And I think um, what we're doing here at Penn. And what's also happening in a lot of this research is to kind of create building materials that create or that themselves create oxygen and absorb carbon, so that buildings themselves breathe and absorb carbon. I think is really the next step. Not, I'm really not necessarily against wood, wood, but I think wood is just such a, or trees on buildings, both are such fake solutions. Sorry for everyone who loves wood construction. But I think it is because we do need trees to breathe. And I, I remember driving through Denmark with the students last year and um, met our uh, professor who teaches here in spring. 
mentioning that we were driving through an extremely bold area, as in bare. And, and I was like, what is happening here? You know, what, what, why is it, what, you know, it's like a desert in Denmark. And she said, oh, we chopped the forest down for toilet paper. And that's the reality of how we think about uh, nature. You know, capitalist extraction happens without any concern for our real needs in the future. And, and that's just toilet paper, right? I'm not even talking about the building industry. So I think, um, yeah, we need to develop new materials. We need to rethink regulations to approve these new materials uh, and certifications uh, processes and to, and to speed that up fast. And I think here in the university, we are really at the spot where we can do it, uh, where we can rethink materials and we can rebuild because Otherwise, you know, I don't see, honestly, any of the other things we come up with are any way, shape, or form enough at this point. I, mean, I, I would just say... Not to be negative. I, I would just say, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of in a post-rationalization phase right now through all this. And um, what, what strikes me is how most of... The, well, so first, how much ideas about modular and fabrication just keep coming up. So Rob obviously is doing a lot of this. Shajay showed some of his work. And then um, there's, there's two chapters uh, as well as one on construction. Where, uh, one, sh one chapter about shops, firm, assembly, and then one about our firm, grow, uh, as well as some, some musings on construction that really start positioning modular. And, and the reason why I think that that's important is because um, in addition to thinking about materials and, and uh, treading more lightly on the environment, which I think everyone can get behind, there really are um, problems facing cities, uh, particular cities. Uh, for instance, the Northeast is in an amazing kind of housing crisis right now, where it, it literally housing is not being built fast enough in municipalities to, to keep costs down to make housing affordable to deal with um, uh, uh, the, the demand, in effect, right? And so um, one, one of the things that we, we talk about a lot in the book and, and, and show examples of is how um, dense modular building um, uh, does, does a number of things. First of all, it, it actually, um, uh, sort of focuses resources, not only in those urban areas, but also in, in, in other allied areas where you know, boxes and things are being, being produced, putting people to work. But then just by the very nature of how these things are designed, we're minimizing footprint for maximizing density, mm -hmm. right? And in doing that, we are um, ultimately operating in a, um, uh, a far more sustainable way mm -hmm. than I think um, other options uh, have been. Right, so, and, I, I, and I think that there's a lot um, surrounding um, technological efforts by architects uh, in terms of how we're engaging these kinds of, these kinds of problems also. So Shajay showed his work about um, a kind of modular uh, uh, kind of factory, right? Uh, and uh, there's some other, some other work in the book that shows how architects are reclaiming space that had traditionally been taken away from us by uh, let's say conventional modular builders that just sought to um, take scope like ceiling architectural drawings or something like that away from us, right? So I, I do think that um, along these lines are an expansion of us understanding what these problems are, right, more globally, and, and still focusing on how to solve them sort of site at a time or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chate, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think like, I mean, a lot has been said on, on, the, on the physical side of things, like opportunities to create sustainable uh, construction industry, like you know, circular economies of, of, uh, um, on, of material and, and reuse and recycling and repair and so on. Um, but I also think, like as architects and uh, as a profession, like we have um, a huge opportunity here to, to like really address. Um, cities as a societal infrastructure, right? It's a critical infrastructure for society to uh, function and to, uh, to prosper. And, and so uh, we as a profession have like a huge opportunity to participate and make these two and a half billion people who are expected 
to be in cities on top of the 4 billion people who are already in cities, uh, more wealthy, healthier, and prosperous. And so uh, that, that to me is like the cre real carrot and the opportunity space is, is to participate in creating prosperity like, and, and, and if, if in the process we have to learn about like other disciplines, like and learn about collaborating, learn about things that we're not part of our profession, uh, like we, sh we should be able to do that because most of like uh, our profession is directly related to creating uh, these prosperous built environments, which is shown increasingly to be critical uh, for the survival of uh, our species. So, um, so I think that's that's really the the, the carrot to to do whatever it takes to to grab it with uh, both our hands. Yeah. Karenza, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't pretend to necessarily uh, capture mentally uh, all the things that uh, we're talking about to, tonight, but I think that. Uh, there's like the realities of a practice, which is uh, you have a client that is asking for you to do something for them, and it's always very specific. So it's it's still to this day site specific, and it's a physical iteration that exists in the world. And so I think the the kind of immediate impact that we can have is to have both a certain responsibility towards again sourcing materials, systems, and, and kind of using kind of innovative, you know, technologies of ways to kind of leverage some of, of these, um, these kind of ecological um, uh, strategies. But, um, and then we also have the opportunities to, to set up the architecture in a way that maybe encourages the public or the people using the architecture to kind of gain a, a sense of maybe where they are, who they are, and, and their place. In, in, in kind of the larger picture um, in a kind of very uh, sensitive way. And I, I do agree with you in terms of we have no shame in going around to other industries <laughs> and looking at what other people are doing. And I'm thinking just like the most outrageous plan of colonizing Mars. Well, that's kind of causing a lot of technologies or, uh, to be developed for just this kind of vision. And it doesn't maybe seem like it has implication in today's world, but it actually has a, a greater influence in, in how we think and how we kind of plan uh, the next step uh, you know, in, in terms of the way we are kind of like moving our careers forward. So I think it's both like an immediate uh, space in which we kind of operate uh, and being aware of where we where we are and, and what we can impact in the immediate way. And then there's that larger picture where that that is both kind of philosophical, but also uh, very much a, a reality in maybe other industries that we have not necessarily been able to kind of achieve on in architecture. Um, just one kind of response to, I think, to something a number of you said, like there's a part in the book where Richard talks about the relationship with um, a modular a fabricator um, and, you know, and you often think about something like this as maybe being close to a design build relationship where there might be not much flexibility. Um, but Richard describes how um, there's actually a dialogue that can take place with the fabricator in, a, in early stages of the project that mitigates for the need for value engineering, geometric rationalization, all these things later on. And, and I think there's um, a, a lot of the issues everyone's raising. Um, I hear students and professionals concerned, say, with things like ChatGPT and all this, that the profession, you know, there was an article in The Guardian talking about will architects disappear, you know, within a decade or something? Uh, you know, and this is like an investigative journalist um, uh, newspaper. It's not, it's, it's an independent newspaper. Um, but when I, when I read these things and I see that we have so many, you know, humanitarian, socioeconomic and environmental needs for architecture um, and that there is going to be so much growth, um, uh, and in fact, that growth is estimated at $1.6 trillion um, in, by 2030 even, like that. Um, then I think we should flip the question around and not be worried about, you know, is there a job, but more like what does the world or what do the individuals need or what does the environment need from architecture? Or, so rather than thinking about how do I have a job, how do I secure my trajectory, it's more like 
Architecture only matters if it matters. Um, so what do we need to be thinking about? What kind of questions do we need to be asking in order to, to see where architecture should go? And if it goes somewhere where it's needed or it's adding value, then I don't think there will be any problem with employment or with uh, income into the profession. Um, I'm just going to open up to any questions, if anyone has any, for Richard and the book or anyone on the panel. Do we have a floating microphone? <clears throat> I think they're trying to get it. We can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, me. Thank you. Hi, yeah. So, uh, with what Winko was saying, with having not using wood, but using instead the bamboo. Would you have that be alive? Because I know that bamboo is really invasive, and I don't want to like put down the idea of that. But also with uh, Rob, your idea with having the three D model buildings, in that idea, I wonder why isn't it more common if it's so sustainable and it's so helpful? Like why isn't it something that's more used and we see it everywhere? Because I know we got your project in China that was. Like super cool, but I wonder why is it not here? Is there not enough mm -hmm. money? Is not enough people into it? Like, what's what's stopping? I don't think it's necessarily unusual. It's just not. It's quite a new material, I think, because bamboo, um, the working of bamboo into a building material is a is a step extra, right? It's because it is skinnier, so it takes a little bit more time, and I think it's not the easiest to do, so people tend to go for the easiest. You know, a tree you can still slice in slices, but you know, from a tree, if we make planks out of a tree, I think what the statistics are, what we, le we lose like 60 or 70% or of the tree before we have a plank, right? So the rest is then pulp or whatever it is, or toilet paper. Um, but so it is not so much that it is not, it's just a step X, like every new building material will be a tiny bit more effort, right? Like if we really want to think of the future, then we have to think just a step a little, you know, and I think what Richard is talking about, you know, the idea of modular building, which means it allows customization, it allows material innovations, it allows for hybrid materials, uh, which are essentially always stronger, better and more durable. So there is, there is an enormous um, opportunity there if we are all willing to think just a step long, you know, a minute longer, a step further to, yeah. to develop these new things. Um, one, I think things can be way more beautiful and two, um, way more interesting for all of us because it allows all of you, uh, the next generation, to become experts in something that is actually not developed that well yet but can be very easily developed and is really the future. So I think it is interesting to think about these things because it allows, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. I think there is a massive future for architects because it's, the, the future is more complex, but it also means we can work on really interesting solutions that other people don't have or maybe haven't gotten to yet. So that this is like actually the moment for us architects to step in, I think. No, that's customization, different than standardization, which actually he already explained when you called it what generalization, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, one other thing that I, I would just say, um, especially for the students here, is um, you know, it's really hard to make novel stuff. Um, and, and what I mean by that is if, if you just kind of move around the halls here, and I, I would encourage any guests to do that while you're here, um, there's plenty of it, right? And, and so architects don't really have a shortage of ideas. That's not the problem. It's been to Karenza's point, you know, that we're always working for a client and there are always constraints and these kinds of things. And so one of the things that, um, try to advocate for in the book is by understanding the work that we do in a kind of larger, more interconnected context, we can actually begin asking more questions and justifying positions that not only gets us that kind of novelty, um, it makes others outside of, you know, 
um, what ends up being a fairly narrow professional set, uh, understanding uh, the, the work that we do and, and our ability to expand scope. Uh, yeah. We can answer it later. Kind of important to think about, you know, like architects are barely involved in most of what gets built uh, in cities around the world, right? Like, and even if we can move the needle by a few percentage points, like it, it can only create more jobs rather than take away. So, um, and 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 also the other part is like the next generation of like as Rob mentioned, like there's a decline of skilled labor. Uh, because there is a decline in pride, like oh, in the built environment, like our buildings are, you know, just hacked together, and there's a decline in quality. Like, I mean, the U.S. got like a D in like its infrastructure report, like, and um, and so this is uh, like so all of this digitization can inject skill back into the industry, which is uh, which is already happening, right? Like that. And uh, the like, younger people, younger generation could be re-excited by a profession which is historically been uh, one of the noble arts. Like, and only in the 20th century we, we've just given up a lot of our scope um, and kind of reduced ourselves to like kind of uh, in 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 our in our impact. Um, and so, with with these technological. Uh, um, opportunities like we can reestablish like our our uh, contributions to society. You know? Don't you think it's also because you know the the way we're evolving in terms of the complexities of the these buildings that we're putting together, it's becoming a collaborative kind of endeavor. Right before you could be like the single the single star architect kind of putting your beautiful pencil on a beautiful piece of paper. Uh, and you know this profession has, you know, is kind of one of the oldest uh, that we know in human civilization. But I think now we have to be open to kind of redefining a little bit how we work and how we approach it. And we we feel that the collaborative aspect is kind of huge, and it doesn't mean that you're giving up real estate, but it, it, it just means that you have to approach a problem in a slightly different way. And I think one of the huge impact that could have us regain control over a lot of that is the kind of computational technology, because it allows you to really kind of speed up the process, allows you to uh, simulate and test many, many, many more uh, um, opportunities or kind of schemes or ways of applying certain certain kind of uh, approaches to kind of assemblies, material, all that stuff. Now we have the, the kind of tools at hand to kind of really retake control of some of that. And so uh, I think it's, I wouldn't be so pessimistic, not so pessimistic in terms of like where we are, but I think we should we should continue to to make headway in the, in the way that we are uh, kind of valuing ourselves uh, and even you guys as students. I mean, yeah, for sure, you may not be practicing the way they were practicing in the 70s, but you shouldn't be, right? Because the world is different, the needs are different, the conditions are very much like a, a different kind of ecosystem. And I think if you can evolve and evolve in that and, and kind of keep going, I think it, it you know, I, I'm I'm not too worried about you know where we're going with our profession, as much as maybe some other <laughs> people no, but might. I be. think I think you're totally right because what I love about your office is that you are doing your own prototype. You know, the last time I was in the office, there was a gigantic facade element hanging from the from the building, and I think you know we have and or you with your uh, software testing the size of apartments versus real estate. I think we are also creating our own opportunities, as you, I think both of you showed very, very well. It's like we're taking over prototyping for new facade modulations or testing real estate models uh, with gaming. I love that, the gaming uh, tool. And uh, gaming is, is something that is really powerful for us to use, to, to test things and to really understand uh, markets differently. So I think rather than, than thinking that it's going backwards, I really think we have so much more uh, agency uh, on this market and in this world than we used to. I, I would agree with all your comments, but just to add one maybe to your question to me about 3D printing, 
Um, so Icon, the 3D printing company I showed, they're doing like a whole suburb in, in Houston, I think it is at the moment, or somewhere in Texas. And, you know, a lot of those houses aren't really traditionally designed by, you know, small practicing architects. They're normally done by big developers, prefabricated parts are built off site. Um, and so in actual fact, because the technology is agnostic to the design to a certain degree, that that company is much more open to having designs done by different architects. So that's an example where it might actually be a positive thing. You might see more architects designing suburban houses, potentially. Um, but then there are other cases where there are different, you could maybe think about practice differently too. There are several architects who have startups in a technology or a fabrication company or a construction company where they're kind of like a new version of design build, but really knowing very well the products that they're making. Um, so there's lots of different ways to think about that. Uh, we have time for one more question. That was a great question too. Uh, here we are. Hey. Um, Thank you for the presentations and uh, for collecting all this work together into a great resource. Um, I was just wondering uh, about the topic of renovating existing buildings uh, and how this sort of uh, sort of central planning for a uh, you know master plan environment. How does that relate to like the pre-existing environment and sort of the existing, if inadequate, housing stock? Mm -hmm. Uh, I could I could give a try on that one. So, um, you know, in in many municipalities now, especially in these urban areas, there has been um, an increase in um, in a, a kind of goal of historic preservation, for instance. Um, but I think um, many um, many of these urban places uh, are realizing that um, the future isn't. Um, small wooden houses that may have existed there for 60 years. So there are, like for instance, one of the places where we work, there's a, there's a very active campaign um, at the level of the city uh, that is enticing landowners to uh, basically consolidate properties. Uh, because with larger properties, you get bigger buildings. The bigger buildings are centralized in terms of uh, the, 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 the positing of density. And that goes back to some of the, um, uh, the, the sustainable kinds of goals that have, have been mm -hmm. talked about today. Um, but yeah, so you, but your question is more about like how does an adaptive reuse agenda fit into what we're talking about? Yeah, yeah. And people, uh, like, you can't ask people to move. Yeah, but I think, you know, the biggest, currently the biggest real estate market in New York is uh, rebuilding offices into uh, housing, which is great because we have good ceiling height in offices. You can use modular units to um, actually create new, there's whole new, there's whole buildings are stripped for these ugly old facades that are not very sustainable, modular units pushed in. I mean, there's a lot going on on that level. Uh, that is actually really productive and very interesting and and funny enough really beautiful um, new housing and living environments so I think that is it 's actually interesting how much that is happening you know also because it 's not only going from housing to better housing it 's going from office or industrial space to housing, which is a little easier in a weird way no it 's more freedom. I think also um, one of the things about uh, adaptive reuse is like it highlights uh, the necessity for designing for disassembly and reassembly, right? Reconfiguring because cities, um, as uh, as they evolve, like they need to change, like and there's no uh, frozen city, and if it is frozen, it's like not functioning. And and so Tokyo, for example, is a great example. You know, it, from the 1950s to now, like it, more than you know, 70% of Japan lives in one city, and and it grew, and then now they're thinking about sustainably shrinking uh, as as the population diminishes, reuse schools that they no longer need into um, community buildings and so on, and so 
the trial and error process of the built environment is huge. Like there's no way we can have a planned uh, city without, uh, like which can be uh, successful and prosperous without accounting for that things need to evolve, things need to change. Uh, like Rome was not built in a day and no other city can be built in a day. And But like we do need to um, build quite a lot like uh, in a short amount of time, and you know, it's almost two and a half billion people in the next 25 years worldwide. Uh, so not everywhere you can have adaptive reuse because there is like, India is only 30% urbanized. Like there is not enough building stock to reuse. Like that we need to build, um, get the rest of 70% of India to be urbanized. And so, um, and same with China, which is like 60% urbanized. So there's still another 30%. Like whereas. Some economies are fully urbanized, like uh, like the U.S. Uh, it might seem like we don't need to build any more here, but actually you do because, like, there's a massive immigration, like, and like there's a new need for new housing. So there is a rebuilding process that needs to happen here, which um, like which means like densifying, which means more infill, which means more. Um, so part of it is also adapt to reuse, but I think to design new buildings so that they can be adapted and reconfigured is is a key 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 mindset going into the future like so uh, adaptive reuse doesn't mean only reuse what's already built but also make sure that your buildings are reusable like um, mm -hmm. great well thank you all and thank thanks you, everybody Richard. do you want to say anything i just uh, this has been really great appreciate everyone coming out Thanks to the panel, thanks to Rob, Winka, Karenza, and Shadjay. Yeah. Awesome.